you say to someone who argues that humans do operate on biological, chemical, physical algorithms? I would say certainly we do. I think there are, you have algorithmic portions of your existence. Just like a calculator, you can add numbers, right? So you, you have algorithmic capabilities. They used to have, in the 1940s, these people, usually women, that would sit and do tedious calculations that were called computers. Have you, what, what was the movie? There was a movie associated. <laughs> yeah, Hidden Figures. And uh, if you think about it, any program that you write, that, uh, that programmer is telling the computer what to do and they could sit down and they could do everything in that computer program with a pencil and paper. It might take them a million years to do it, but anything, anything that they, anything, any program that they write can be duplicated by a human. So the human computers go before Turing's machine in terms of their capability of executing algorithms. So yes, absolutely, we do have that. But my point is, is we have these non-algorithmic capabilities also, which will prohibit artificial intelligence from ever duplicating us in terms of artificial general intelligence or super intelligence. I could just follow up. Uh, I, I, found, I find a phrase that's useful uh, without remainder. You know, and I think we, we all operate algorithmically. I, I mean, I'll sometimes watch myself if I'm driving or if I'm flipping a switch and something happens. I mean, I can just see my behaviors. I mean, they're automatic, and I have this intention, but, it, you know, why is my body doing what it is? I mean, there, there's, there are algorithms that are going on, but to say that we have algorithmic aspects to us does not mean that we are algorithmic without remainder, you know? And I think that's the point. Is there... Is it all? Is it nothing but? I mean, I remember there was this one uh, person who used to talk about nothing buttery. You know, it was that that this is this mentality of the uh, our, of the scientific materialist that it's nothing but that. You know, and why should we think that it's nothing but that? Sure, we algorithms operate. You know, but there's more. We have someone asking something, building on the idea of non-algorithmic uh, information. Wouldn't a non-algorithmic system break the law of conservation of information? How robust is this law? Uh, no, it, it doesn't because uh, conservation of information it says that uh, at best we can conserve. In, so it's it's that there's not a necessarily a constancy of information, but that actually as information gets expressed, it's it, the information that's needed to do interesting things diminishes. So there's always, as it were, information is getting, as it were, more and more complicated. But even with that, uh, there's in, conservation of information points to an ultimate source of information. And what is that ultimate source? I mean, you, you can, I mean, this is where I think intelligent design, it's not strictly theistic. I mean, you can get some sort of Neoplatonic intelligence where everything is some sort of necessary emanation or some sort of stoic conception. There are lots of things that are possible uh, to try to accommodate intelligent design. And I think this is one reason why certain Christians have been skeptical of intelligent design because it's, it, it doesn't give you the personal transcendent creator God of Christianity. But, uh, you know, but no, I mean, uh, conservation of information doesn't, doesn't do anything to undercut uh, Christian faith or, you know, what we're about. I will say that Alan Turing recognized, Alan Turing recognized that, uh, you know, there were non-algorithmic things. So he, he um, appealed to the idea of an oracle. An oracle was somebody external to the computer program which gave it insight, which gave it creativity. Any creativity that comes out of a computer program is associated with the programmer's intellect and the programmer's creativity. And, but once you have the program going, there is no going to be more, no more um, creation of information within that program other than what was infused by the programmer. Uh, someone actually has a question about Turing, uh, and you, maybe what you just said addresses it, but how did Turing prove there could not be a halt oracle? That is, if given enough training data, could a computer analyze other programs? Well, I would, uh, I would point to <laughs> another book plug, uh, Introduction to Evolutionary Informatics by Bill, Winston, Ewart, and me. 
And in one of the chapters, we give a very nice proof of this. The proof is done by reducto absurdium. Uh, Turing assumes that there does exist a program that can do the halting. He goes through the math and he shows that the assumption was incorrect. And then by proof by contradiction, he therefore shows that the halting problem is not possible. So that's a very high level description. If you want to get down and dirty into the mathematics, Mathematics. I would, I would suggest uh, our book where we talk about that specifically. Okay. Uh, can habits become an algorithm? For instance, if a person cultivates a habit of complaining, can that take on algorithmic properties? There's something called Leibniz experiment, which is really, really fascinating. And what it says is that you are told in your brain um, what to do before you know you want to do it. Now that doesn't sound very good initially. But it turns out that you have the capability of having that, um, ha having that um, action and uh, you don't have to do that action. You can say no to whatever that inclination is. In other words, Leibniz coined the term free won't. So when I was quitting smoking, I had lots of things. Have a cigarette, no. Have a cigarette, no. Have a cigarette, no. And then according to Hebb's law, what you're building is these neuron highways. Between, between triggers and your so-called response. And you need to fight those with the free won't in order to rebuild that. So I would say there's probably a degree of algorithms in the terms of your paths of your brain, but we, we transcend that. We have the ability to say no to these neural pathways which we have built up in our addiction to your cell phones, <laughs> okay, for example. Yeah, let, let me jump in there. I mean, there's a sense, I think, within Christian understanding of the human being that we're always responsible, okay? Responsible as in able to respond. From a pure AI position, we are not responsible. We are basically these stimulus response machines. We're operating automatically. And so even with habits, there can be algorithmic elements perhaps, but there's always a sense in which we can step back and say, I can do differently. I can say no. Okay, um, one more question about algorithmic things or, or a statement that you can reflect on. Then we have a couple theologically related questions I want to get to uh, before we end. Uh, if we cannot emulate non-algorithmic aspects, might that show evidence of soul? Uh, yes, I, I would say definitely. Okay. I would say that the dualists that believe that mind is more than the brain uh, recognize that there's something going on there that the mind is greater than the brain. And a lot of these things which go on in the mind must be the algorithmic part, or the non-algorithmic part, right? That's where some of these non-algorithmic uh, ideas come from, is from the mind. Now, there are those that disagree. Roger Penrose, who won the Nobel Prize, says he looked around the world and he said, is there anything in this naturalistic world that is non-algorithmic? And he thought and he thought, and the only thing he could come up with was quantum collapse. So he believes that all these non-algorithmic, by the way, Roger Penrose totally agrees with everything I told you here today. But he believes that this source of creativity has come from quantum collapse in the microtubules of our brain. And in some way, this manifests itself as uh, creativity and such. Unfortunately, with Penrose's suggestion, a follow-up by an anesthesiologist named Hammerhoff, uh, they beat this for a while, and it's totally faded. There's been no follow-up, and it doesn't look like there's any, any traction to that theory. Okay. Uh, so, one of the more theologically related questions. Uh, might we not see human development of artificial general intelligence as an extension of the creation mandate to be fruitful and increase, allowing us to send minds deep into space? You know, good luck with that. I mean, you know, no, no, nothing we're saying, you know, it's, it's not like, you know, we're trying to kill the research, but I would say... Uh, if artificial general intelligence is going to take off, we, we need some new ideas, something, you know, current, you know, I, this, this was maybe the best joke I've heard in a while about uh, artificial general intelligence being programmed not with Python or C++, but with, uh, you know, PowerPoint. You know, it's, it's just not happening. The ideas aren't there. So, uh, you know, you know, 
why think that it's going to happen? I mean, on the sort of materialistic grounds, I don't think there's any good, good reason to think that it's going to happen. So, uh, you know, if, if you're going to, if you're an NSF program officer, you know, that's, you know, and if you were thinking rationally, if you weren't being, weren't swayed by a materialistic world outlook, I would say that's not where you're going to put your money because there's nothing happening there. I mean, five years, I mean, Bob has been at this game for 50 years or so. You know, I've been at it for about 40 years, you know, where I, I sat in on my first artificial intelligence class at, uh, when I was a uh, beginning grad student. You know, and you, you see the, this kind of, it's like the stock market or more, maybe more like Bitcoin, you know, it goes up and down, uh, you know, you know. It was, uh, it was right around the corner that humans would get conscious, you know, and then it stopped. Now, we, you know, it was going to be level five automation with driving. That was, that was the big thing. All these truck drivers were going to be put out of business. Well, that was about four or five years ago. Now that's, that's gone because, you know, the, the sensors don't work, you know. You, you, you think you're driving, you know, under a viaduct. Instead, you plow a, into a school bus, you know, <laughs> and that's, that, that's not good. So, uh, you know, so, yeah, good luck. I mean, if you can figure it out. But, I mean, there, there's some really hard problems, and it's not enough just to throw a materialistic philosophy at it and say, well, it's got to be because, you know, what else could there be? Well, uh, there could be a spiritual reality that makes an actual difference in the world. Another thing I would, um, I would add to that is I have a friend, Summer Bringjord, he's at Rensselaer, who agrees with, you know, what we talked about here. He goes out and he has debates with people that believe in superintelligence. And he says, when is this going to happen? They say, in, at least in 15 years. He said, I'll bet you $20,000 that in 20 years that we do not have superintelligence. And uh, you and I are both old. We might be dead then, but we'll put it in a trust fund, agree on a referee that, uh, that decides whether superintelligence has been achieved in the, sort of, in the sort of way that we've defined it here. He has had not one taker. I almost just want to end there, but someone did ask an intriguing question that I think we'll end on and we'll have to be short, but um, how do you think the concept of a singularity, artificial sentience, which you've actually just pushed back on, but plays into an end times revelation scenario? For example, AI as antichrist. <laughs> well, or I'd say at least, let's say even if it's not artificial general intelligence, there's lots of stuff AI can do. You know. Well, I would say if, the, if it has anything to do with, um, with the end times, there's going to be a human behind it. Yeah, I think it's Wizard of Oz. Somebody is behind the curtain, and you think something else is going on. Uh, a colleague of ours, Jay Budzhevsky, I remember years back, he used the phrase illusion of possibility. And that, that's a phrase that stuck with me because, you know, I've been hearing about up, people uploading themselves onto computers for years and years, you know, and I don't think we're anywhere, you know, closer to that. I mean, I remember Paul Davies at a, I was at a conference at Santa Fe Institute, I think in 1999, where he was talking about his 16-year-old son at the time who was all intrigued with this. Uh, you know, so there, there's been no palpable progress made toward achieving any of this stuff. But the thought that it might be achievable, that illusion of possibility, I think is, is very compelling to people. And it, it has consequences. It doesn't have scientific consequences. It doesn't, at the end of the day, change the underlying computer science. It doesn't move things from PowerPoint to Python. But it does uh, influence how people think about themselves and the public policy decisions they make for for us, and uh, you know, and uh, the undermining of faith as a consequence. Reminds me of something else you wrote, Bill, uh, years ago about promissory materialism. You know, always the note is in the mail. You know, the check is in the mail, or, uh, and that seems to be a general mode of argument on the materialist side. I think this is another example of that. Let's thank uh, our speakers and for a great session.